Shepard actually had a contract that had been drafted for her. The acrimony between Norma Shear and Joan Crawford was very real. Joan believed that over the years, Norma had gotten roles that should have been hers because she was married to Thalberg. And Joan still held the grudge. And according to our resident Norma Shear expert, Darren Barnes, who I think is here with us tonight, Woo. Norma did not want to make the movie, but while she went along only because Mayor insisted and she left town as soon as filming was over. It's not a very, you know, it's the least thankful role for sure. Uh, but, you know, that's our Norma. Most everyone tried to make nice and even the behind the scene camera talent were thrown bouquets. MGM's costume designer, Adrian, was given an, frankly, inexplicably lengthy Technicolor fashion show in the middle of the black and white film. And the story goes that Sydney's, the beauty salon where much of the action takes place, was named after the studio's hairstylist, Sydney Gulrock. The women also marked the final 1939 landing for George Cooper after he had moved on from The Wizard of Oz and then pushed out of The Gone with the Wind, reportedly because Clark Gable was concerned he was a women's director. Where better to prove his skill than this film? <laughs> but back to the movie at MGM, where both F. Scott Fitzgerald and Jane Murphy adapted scripts. The play had originally been bought for $125,000, as a vehicle for, wait for it, Claudette Colbert to be directed by Gregory LaCava. Oh. Now, that's a little hard to visualize. Mm -hmm. But at one point, Carol Lombard was attached, and that mm. could have been interesting. It went through a couple more incarnations before Hans Stromberg uh, assigned a script to Anita Luce. Now, Anita had sold her first script to Biograph way back in 1912 for $25. And she liked to say she was a young teenager at the time. But actually, she was in her early 20s. God love her. She came to Hollywood from San Diego to write for Griffith in 1915. And the letters she sent to her were all addressed to Miss Luce. Anita would later say, oh, they didn't know I was a woman. Oh, they knew. And nobody cared. Uh, what, you know, if she did the work, that's all they cared about. Anyway, she worked consistently. It was the success of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, as syndicated in the Bazaar magazine, and then published as a novella in 1926, that gave her the freedom to keep writing for the next, to stop writing for the next five years. She and her husband, John Emerson, traveled through Europe and Palm Beach and living the life she thought she wanted. But when he ran through all her money, and the depression hit hard. I think she was relieved to go to work at MGM in 1931, and she had been there ever since. She claimed to be able to just whip off the first draft, but in reality, every word she presented herself, she presented herself as a carefree gamine, but she struggled over every word and agonized. And if she kept falling in love with men not worthy of her by a long shot, she could live vicariously through her scripts. The women went through the cam went before the cameras a month after Anita had handed the play been handed the play to her death. And she was the perfect choice to tweak the almost one hundred lines or phrases that the Hayes office deemed unacceptable. Anita was in her element as she changed the word virgin to frozen asset. <laughs> <laughs> and loaded it up on double entendres. As a result, her script glided past the censors, and she heightened the bitchy wit, the bitchy wit while diluting the mean spiritness. Anita's restructuring resulted in the creation of a most memorable film. If you're ever looking for something to do on a Saturday night, and I've done this actually twice, read the play while watching the film. It, it's a revelation. Mm -hmm and a veritable textbook on the subtlety of arc, character development, and dialogue, and cliff notes for how they got around the Hayes office, that's for sure. Kukor insisted Anita be at his side on the set throughout the filming, and she even helped write and edit the trailer, another triumph for that strong and talented woman in a year. 
that when so many shined. Of course, all films should be seen on the big screen um, and watching these women in action with all their sly glances, eye rolls, and slight smiles is just a joy. They play flawed but charismatic and dynamic characters that inspired imaginations. And 75 years ago, no one asked if actresses could open a movie. They just did it over and over again. And for what I'm sure is not the first time for many of you, enjoy the women. Thank you. <laughs>